Welcome everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, this is, we call, my husband and I call today first date anniversary because our first date was on Valentine's Day many years ago. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hi, Nicole. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Michelle. Hi, hi Holly. Hi, Scott. All right. Should we go ahead and get started? We got a lot of content to get through today. I know. I was just waiting. <laughs> I've seen some folks come in and, um, Hello and welcome to the Homeroom Network Community of Practice, our seventh session together. Um, and we're, today we're going to be talking about establishing and sustaining nutrition efforts for students experiencing homelessness. So um, as always, um, <clears throat> We're going to do a little bit of a welcome. I know a lot of us know each other um, by now, but just to connect, go ahead and say hello in the chat box and please share your name and pronouns, your um, district, and how have you been practicing self-care this winter? So um, you should be able to see that on the screen, give you a little time to type that up. And I did want to say while you're doing that to say our welcome and thank you to ODE. We have Susanna here with us today. I will do we'll do introductions in a little bit, but um, not just our Ohio folks. Um, as always, we have ODE here to support. So while you're doing your welcome in the chat, again, I'm Amanda Wilson. I am the um, Youth Housing Initiative Director, Initiatives Director at Cohio, and I use she, her pronouns. And um, for self-care, I have been reading. I've been reading a lot, uh, mostly novels, some nonfiction. I've read nine books so far in 2023. So that's uh, how I've been decompressing and doing my self-care. Um, all right. Oh, Somebody's been getting massages. Love that for self care. Oh. <laughs> that was lovely. I love it. Oh, getting a walk in every day. Yes. Excellent. Love it. Well, keep those coming in. Um, Evelyn's got up our Zoom logistics slide. Um, you can unmute. Uh, so that's a gift and gift and a caution. So we'd love to have you unmute and talk with us and ask questions and share about what's going on in your community. And if you are not doing one of those things, please stay muted. Um, we always invite you to share your camera if you are able and feel comfortable. We love to see your faces. Please ask questions throughout, whether off mute or in the chat. We will make sure that you have access to the content. We are going to be doing our breakout rooms today and having some discussion. Um, we don't have any polls or quizzes per se, but we are going to leave some time at the end of the session for you to provide some feedback um, in a couple of different ways. Um, oh, I'm still oh, listening to audiobooks and mindfulness meditation, great self-care practices. Um, and then of course, if you're having an AV issue, we invite you to do the tried and true, log out and log back in. We will be watching to make sure that people can get into the room if you need to leave. Um, so our agenda for today, we're doing our introductions. Um, we're gonna share some content about food insecurity and trauma associated with that talk about the eligibility for free school meals, and then do some best practices and discussions. Do we need to do a, do we need to mute? Um, and uh, so some in-school nutrition services, providing food uh, outside of school, and then our closing and resources. Um, I still love to see these self-care practices coming in. So we've got another vote for mind mindfulness and also yoga. Very relaxing. Um, 
So to introduce our team, again, I'm Amanda Wilson. I also am joined by Ami Diallo and Evelyn Guerin. Um, and do either of you want to, and then of course, Susanna is here from ODE. And does do any of the three of you want to share what your self-care practice has been this winter? Yeah, I'm Ami. <laughs> Good to see you all again. I think my, well, not I think. There's two things that I've been doing. Audiobook is life-changing, okay? Like, <laughs> I just started that this year and it's been amazing. And the next thing that I do is walking. I love being out, even for like a few minutes. So that's my self-care. Hi, everyone. I'm Evelyn Guerin. Um, I think... I've also been trying to read more this winter. That's kind of my like New Year's resolution. Um, and I've also been trying to get to the gym more, but I will say my motivation really, once it's 5 p.m. and it's starting to get dark outside, it is so hard to get me to leave my house. So I've been trying, but it has not always worked out for me. <laughs> Susanna, I don't know if you wanted to share. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. I'm Susanna Wayland, um, and I self-care. So I did the book thing um, one of the years of COVID. So I'm moving on to um, webinars now, and I keep a consistent at least one walk a day. Um, and when I can't get out, I do a little bouncing on a mini tramp. So <laughs> Uh, love it my sister does the trampoline she loves it. it's hard I tried it at her house I was like you're bouncing on a little trampoline I was like man I'm I'm sweating my I'm, yeah. my heart is racing it's, it's a real <laughs> workout it is good good for the lymphatic system <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing those and um, coming off mute to introduce yourselves. Thanks to everyone who is sharing in the chat. Please continue to feel free to introduce yourself, uh, share the area you work in, and also your winter self-care practice. And with that, I am already two minutes over my allotted intro time. So I'm going to turn it over to Ami to uh, get us a little uh, more serious and into our content for today. Thank you so much, Amanda. So um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture uses the following definition of food insecurity, right? The limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe food or limited or uncertain ab uh, ability to acquire acceptable food in socially acceptable ways. So while accessing food, as you know, is challenging for many families with children, especially in this climate with high food prices, families experiencing homelessness often face additional barriers because of high mobility and lack of transportation. And we are all aware of that. And as we all know, um, consistent access to sufficient quantities and quality of food is vital for a child physical mental and emotional development, right? And children who do not get enough food to eat may experience food insecurity, which is a form of trauma. And that leads to a variety of side effects and impact their ability not only to concentrate, absorb information, learn, or even socialize in school because <laughs> being hungry negatively impact our mood. And it also can manifest as anxiety about or a preoccupation with food impacting the ability to develop food regulation skills, right? And they are also prone to engaging in risky behavior because we gotta eat when we are hungry. So such as stealing or trading sex for money to buy food. And all these experiences have the potential to like aggravate trauma, right? So next slide, please. So student experience, I'm sure like you are all aware of this already. Students experiencing homelessness are categorically eligible for free school meal through the Richard B. Russell National Lunch School Act, right? And these students and their families do not have to complete an application for free meal. The U.S. Department of Agriculture policies allow for automatic enrollment of these students, which is known as direct certification, to ensure they receive meal quickly. So how can you expedite the delivery of nutritional benefit to schools? You do that 
by providing student name, if necessary, provide additional information such as maybe the birth date or student ID number, effective dates or signature of local liaison. And all of this can be sent through fax or email. Or you can also use an electronic data match that include this information, which is also acceptable, okay? So once the above documentation has been provided to the school nutrition program, the student must be directly certified. And one thing that you have to keep in mind is, school males personnel do not have the discretion to decline directly certifying children who have been documented to be categorically eligible. So let's say the liaison is not at school on that day and an administrator knows that a student is experiencing homelessness, but is concerned that there might be a delay in obtaining documentation from the local liaison. So what can the administrator do? You complete an application on behalf of the student so the student can begin receiving free meal immediately and then follow up with the liaison to obtain the documentation, the needed documentation. So um, <laughs> in the line of work that we all are in, we know confidentiality is vital in our work. And information about student eligibility studies should not be shared without parents' consent. consent. Right? <laughs> but as always, there are a few exceptions to the rules, such as sharing information with other school district or program when a student changes school. So usually when a student changes school, we're always wondering, can we share information with this new district? Yes, you can. Those are some of the exceptions. Sharing name and male eligibility status with um, person connected directly with the administration or enforcement of a federal education program or local means tested nutrition program with eligibility uh, standard compared to those of the school meal programs. And those are like Medicaid or the, uh, the state child health insurance program also known as SCHIP. So one of the things that we did, because I know when it comes to nutrition, there's a lot of questions, especially with everything that is going on right now with like the climate and all the high food prices. So we gathered um, the National Education Center of Homeless, gathered some like FAQ, and we decided to share some of those with you. Uh, these are some of the questions that district usually ask them. So they gather them in one place. And you can also find this brief link in the resources slide at the end of this um, slide. So the first question is to know if public schools that do not have school meals program are obligated to provide food to students experiencing homelessness. And as you can see, the answer is no. There's no obligation to provide with food if a school does not have a federal meal program. But however, many schools choose to provide meal by, not, by partnering with um, other school district and community partner, which actually can be an excellent way to improve achievement because we wanna make sure these kids are fed. And Evelyn will elaborate more on how to go about the collaboration. And the second question that um, people have been asking have been, are private schools obligated to provide food to the student experiencing homelessness? Or is the local public school obligated to provide meals to those students? That's two questions. The first question is a no. Private schools are not obligated to provide meal to the student. And the second question is also no, public schools are not obligated to provide meal to students experiencing homelessness that attend private schools. Okay. Next slide, please. So two more FAQs. So this one was asking how should unpaid meal fees from before a student is identified as homeless be handled? So once a student is identified as experiencing homelessness, 
they are categorically eligible for free meal regardless of unpaid fees, okay? Um, the next is, if a student experiencing homelessness changes school, does the student continue to receive free school meal in the new school? Once a child is certified, a student is certified as eligible to receive free school meal, okay. he remains, any questions? Oh. Okay. It remains effective for the remainder of the school year and continue up to 30 days of the following school year or until a new eligibility determination is made. Good? Okay, awesome. So you guys know we will always talk about some professional development. It is recommended that local liaisons provide information about homelessness to nutrition program administrators and cafeteria managers who can be important partners in identification and yet likely to be unfamiliar with criteria for being uh, homeless under the, McKin under the McKinney Vento Act. So why it is the local liaison who authorized, who is authorized by the McKinney Vento Act to make the final determination of eligibility and to provide documentation to school meal staff, nutrition and cafeteria personnel can actually play a vital role in identifying students experiencing homelessness who have not yet been in contact with the liaison, okay? So many uh, local liaison, what they do, they provide training for child nutrition personnel, register and other school and district staff member who may be in position, position to ensure that these eligible students are receiving free school meals, okay? And also um, it is important, one of the things that is important for local liaison to keep in mind is this training that they offer to staff member needs to cover um, topics such as common signs of homelessness because there are so many of them, right? How to refer children to the local liaison because those are some of the things that we assume everybody is aware of, but not necessarily. And understand the local pro uh, procedures for connecting eligible students to free meals and other services. Okay, comparable services. When it comes to comparable services, the law is very clear. The McKinney-Vento Act states that student experiencing homelessness have the right to services comparable to those offered to other students. And because of that, district must provide these students with nutrition services equivalent to those provided to permanently house students. The law is very clear on it, okay? I know I've been talking for a minute, <laughs> so now, we are gonna go over nutrition requirements. This is gonna be an opportunity for you guys to network. We're gonna have a discussion about current challenges in your district in meeting these requirements and consideration for addressing these challenges, okay? So we're gonna give you 10 minutes in breakout room to discuss the following question. The first question is, what challenges is your district facing in providing nutrition services to students experiencing homelessness? That's the first question. The second question is, how do you work with your nutrition and cafeteria personnel to identify student experiencing homelessness? And the third question is, does your district have specific nutrition services available for unaccompanied homeless youth. So please take a picture of these questions. If you can, before going, out, going into the breakout room, we will also make sure that we broadcast them so you have them. And please designate someone to report out because we wanna hear how you guys are like dealing with these challenges. Evelyn, can you please put everyone in the breakout room? Thank you so much. Thanks, Evelyn. Welcome back, everyone. So anyone would like to share some of these challenges? Please feel free. Cool. 
Who wants to be brave? <laughs> All right, I'll go, I'll be brave since no one else will. Thank you so much, I appreciate you, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so one thing that was discussed in our group was um, communicating with the cafeteria staff that the student is eligible for McKinney-Vento and how that's done, um, especially in like a district like mine where it is a large area and we have 20 plus schools communicating that information to all cafeteria staff with a turnover of staff. So that was one thing we um, discussed is that's been a hurdle. Okay. Thank you so much, Michelle. Michelle, what district are you from? Oh, I'm with Canton City. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm wondering, um, Probably others have that, even in small districts. So like giving consideration to um, meetings at the beginning of the year about flow of communication can be really helpful. Um, but thank I think you for most your of comment. us I think most of us missed that because it took so long to put us back into the room. So whatever was said just a few minutes ago before Susanna, um, I, at least I think the others in my room didn't hear. So it was just the reflection that um, the need to have um, communication with the nutrition staff when eligibility is determined and what that looks like in a big okay. um, urban setting or just in a big school district. How do you manage that and then navigate that and ensure uh, even with high turnover in the nutrition staff? Um, so. Yeah, that was the comment and the challenge. Thank Thanks, Susanna. Anyone else? I know you had great yeah. conversations. Um, I'll share from one, one concern that we had was um, the concern that the funding um, from COVID, um, like their benefits would run out and um, you know, from food pantries or um, I think it was mainly from food pantries. I don't know if someone in my group wants to respond, um, but another concern like I had was, you know, are we, we in our school district, we used to have uh, food packs that went home on the weekends. And um, I don't necessarily know if that's happening anymore. Um, and that's something that I need to bring up to our nutritional staff. Um, but I think the concern was the funding for that programs had from COVID relief funds, and they're just not having those anymore. Or um, families that had extra benefits um, from the COVID relief fund, and they're not receiving those benefits anymore. Those summer COVID meals, we had we had districts literally driving busloads of meals around to drop off points for uh, for the majority of the summer. Um, both of those, what would have been twenty and twenty one, um, with with meals for kids, and and what I just you know that funding sort of went away, and I think any time there's there's a support, especially for those kinds of supports that, you know, you get used to that support. And in the meantime, prices are increasing. So when you lose that support, not only do you need to come up with that money to make up for it, but you also have the huge, you know, inflationary increase. So families that had a bit more security over the summer with those COVID summer meals through school districts. Not only do they not have that food support, but they have an extra long bridge to cross to get that kind of support. In our case, I think we have a lot of smaller districts. I think we're doing a pretty good job of once those kids are identified, 
getting them in line for, for benefits and food supports and those things. However, there's still a problem getting those kids identified. And I think we have a lot of older youth, adolescents, who just aren't accepting some of the weekend backpacks and things we're doing. And I really worry about those kids with with food security in the evenings and weekends. So the SNAP benefits that, that you were referring to earlier that our group was talking about for the food benefits for the phase, that's going to decrease in as much as $200 a month. Yeah, the SNAP benefits are going away, but they, the, you know, the co we had we had several school districts that were still providing meals through the summer of the two prior summers um, through that COVID money. And that's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I'll mute now. Oh, thank you so much, Scott, for sharing that and Jamie and, you know, Holly. I appreciate that. Um, Evelyn is gonna talk a little bit more about um, funding. So if you have any other challenges that we're not share, please use the chat and we're gonna keep uh, going. Evelyn, do you wanna go to the next slide? It's all yours. Thanks, Sami. And good afternoon, everyone. So as a follow-up to our discussion that we just had, I also wanted to show everyone um, the results from this session's registration poll that asked each of you about your district or ESC's capacity for providing or meeting the needs of nutrition needs of students experiencing homelessness on a scale of one to five, with one being low capacity and five being high capacity. Um, so as you can see, a small number of you selected two, the majority of you, over 50% of you selected three, about a quarter of you selected four, and just one district selected five. When I look at this, this kind of tells me that maybe the majority of you feel that you can meet the basic requirements of uh, nutrition needs, but feel that you would like to be able to do more. Um, so I would love if any of you, while we move on, would love to share in the chat why you chose the number you did for your ESC or district. I would like to ask you to come off mute, but we have a lot of content to cover today, so I want to keep it moving. But if you want to share that in the chat, I think that would just be helpful for all of us to know kind of where you're coming from. So while breakfast and or lunch at school meet the nutrition needs of students experiencing homelessness while school is in session, we also know that these needs persist after school and on weekends. In order to support students' access to adequate food, school districts and ESC should, should consider strategies for ensuring access to food after hours. Strategies might include collaborating with community partners to address gaps in services, connecting and referring families to additional resources and key benefits, and or creating school or district food pantries. And I'm gonna discuss each of these strategies further on the following slides. During our registration survey, some of you had questions about sending leftover cafeteria food home with students. So I wanted to provide some information today on why that is not allowed. Um, it's partially an issue of food safety requirements as schools are required to produce, serve and store food in conjunction with state and local health codes to maintain the highest level of food safety for our students. It's also because schools can't be reimbursed for meals consumed off site. Um, the National School Lunch Program regulations intend that reimbursable meals are to be served and consumed as part of the school program or on or on school premises or school related premises. So sending food home with a child would constitute a non program food that is therefore not reimbursable and cannot be covered by National School Lunch Program funds. Um, and lastly, there is just concern that students could be overtly identified or have their eligibility status is closed if we were to provide those services. So these are just some of the reasons that that is unfortunately not an allowable use of leftover cafeteria food. <clears throat> so now that I've talked about some of the things that you can't do, I wanna talk about some of the things that you can do to meet after hour needs. Um, so community-based organizations can play a really unique and valuable role in meeting nutrition needs of students experiencing homelessness after hours or on weekends. One way external partners can offer support is by collecting and providing donations for a school or district food pantry or providing food donations directly to families themselves. Donations for school food pantries can also be collected through internal district collaboration with school staff and other district families providing the, providing the donations. This could be done through maybe an annual district food drive to raise awareness of homelessness in your community, or you could provide a drop-off point for ongoing donations throughout the year. Weekend food programs resulting from collaborations among schools, community foundations, civic groups, the faith community, food banks, and other organizations are also becoming increasingly common. 
Local food businesses or farms for those of you in rural areas may also have a special interest in providing food for children and youth experiencing homelessness. We can also support the nutrition needs of students and families experiencing homelessness by making sure they're connected to key benefits. Liaisons can help families apply for SNAP benefits that can be used to buy food at grocery stores or farmers markets. And it's important to note that unaccompanied homeless youths are eligible for SNAP benefits as well. Beyond food, families receiving SNAP benefits, as most of you know, can also typically receive free or discounted admission to museums, zoos, and other um, entertainment spaces in your community. So while that goes beyond nutrition needs, I still think it's an important part of that program to be highlighted. Um, liaisons can also refer students and families to after school programs, daycare centers, and emergency shelters that provide food through the Child and Adult Care Food Program, otherwise known as CACFP. CACFP is a federally funded USDA program that enables child and adult care institutions to provide nutritious meals and snacks as a regular part of their care. You can contact the Ohio Department of Education's Office of Nutrition Services to either apply for program funds yourself or to locate participating facilities in your community that you could then refer families to. When other sources of food are unavailable, districts may use Title I Part A funds and McKinney-Vento subgrant funds to pay for food. Purchasing food is an allowable use of Title I Part A set-aside funds whenever reasonable and necessary to enable students experiencing homelessness to take advantage of educational opportunities and when funding is not reasonably available from another source. The McKinney-Vento Act also authorizes McKinney-Vento subgrant funds to be used to provide food to attract, engage, and retain students experiencing homelessness in public school programs, as well as on an emergency basis to enable them to attend school. And many of you also have received ARP funding, so I wanted to add that ARP funds should not be used to purchase food except for emergency situations. You should be utilizing your community connections first, then these other two sources of funding, and as a last resort for emergencies, that's when ARP funds can come in. Regardless of how you choose to provide food services to students and families experiencing homelessness, it's important to ensure that the food provided can effectively meet their needs. So the districts and ESC should consider the following questions when providing nutrition services. First, is the food being provided in an accessible location? Since many families and youth who are experiencing homelessness lack reliable transportation, providing food at school or another primary community location, perhaps one that is along a transportation route, helps eliminate additional barriers. Can the food being provided be made easily or does it require appliances the family may not have access to? Meals with simple instructions and limited need for cooking and kitchen appliances are key to ensuring the food provided can be utilized by its recipients. Does the food provided represent a variety of different food groups? It's essential to ensure that students experiencing homelessness are receiving nutritious, well-rounded meals that can promote healthy growth and development. And is the food provided culturally and religiously appropriate for its recipients? If your district has a high minority population, it's important to ensure that the food provided meets the cultural needs of the family. A Muslim student, for example, should not be given a weekend food box with any type of pork in it. We don't want families to have to choose between their cultural or religious standards and their nutritional needs. <clears throat> and is the food provided in a way that does not stigmatize the student? It's really important to provide the food in a backpack, bag, or other discrete container that does not make it obvious the student is receiving food. We know that stigma can be a big barrier to attending and participating in school, so we don't want to create another reason that our students aren't attending school. So while these are considerations um, and not requirements, we recognize that districts may not have the capacity to meet all of these standards. This is what we should be striving for in order to best meet the needs of students and families experiencing homelessness. So now it's time for us to get back into our breakout rooms for another discussion, um, this time about your strategies for providing food services after hours and on weekends. We're gonna give you another 10 minutes in breakout rooms to discuss the following questions. The first one is what are your districts or ESC's current practices for meeting nutrition needs outside school or service center hours? The second is where might there be opportunities for collaboration when it comes to providing nutrition services for students experiencing homelessness? And the third is how does or could your district ensure that food provided to families is of good quality and culturally appropriate? Or how does your district avoid stigmatizing students and families when providing these services? So please take a picture of these questions so that you have them. We'll also broadcast them in the chat, but this way you're ready for conversation right when you get into your breakout rooms. And please also 
designate a group member to share the key points of your discussion with the group when we come back. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. All right, it looks like most people are back from their breakout room. So we're gonna be mean again and make someone share what they talked about. <laughs> Yeah, we know we only have a few minutes left, but we'd love to hear from someone about some of what you've discussed. We kind of got in a, on a little tangent about uh, food deserts. Um, some of our homeless individuals definitely have transportation issues also, and, you know, where they're living in rural Ohio, it's, it's hard for them to get anywhere that would carry nutritious, fresh foods. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing. Barb's just picking on me here. Uh, yeah, we were interested about the food pantries in, inside the schools, and we thought that those were really great ideas. And we were trying to figure out with each school, what are the numbers of unaccompanied youth that we had uh, and, and compare that to how well the, the pantry would be used? Uh, does anyone out there um, have, those of you that have food pantries in your buildings uh, and they are stocked and supplied, what are the numbers of unaccompanied youth that you have to um, um, justify the, the pantry? Is it just, like, I think we have what under, we just deal with one, our middle school and our high school. I think we, we're probably about 20 or down. And is that about similar with everyone else? Hmm. Phil, before we I go. I don't think, oh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I don't think you would want to just open up the pantry to just your McKinney Vento students though. You would open yes. it up to the whole building for the whole for the whole building to utilize. So Correct. and I think I think the need would yes. be totally justified. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I and I'm gonna interrupt here. This is Susanna just to make it clear that we cannot use our ARP funds to to stock that pantry. So it has to be other funds. It's only extraordinary um, emergencies that we use either Title I homeless set aside, um, as Evelyn said, or the American Rescue Plan funds, because we know that just like within the housing space, there is community resources for food. I know it's not always easy, depending on your demographic. Um, however, we have to be very cautious with using these federal funds for food. Um, but we need to figure out ways to sustain our students and, and use other funding sources that, um, and community partners. So I think um, Marion had that question in the chat as well. So we're responding to both Phil and Marion Dangerfield there. So, Thank you. Okay. Um, but numbers <laughs> are important. So if anyone has an idea about how to track that, certainly chime in. Any last thoughts, <clears throat> excuse me, any last thoughts anyone wants to share before we move on? I know we're almost at the hour, so I don't wanna keep anyone over time, but we also feel like this is a really beneficial part of these communities practice, so. Um, during our breakout group, somebody, uh, her name is Dawn, brought up this amazing idea of uh, families that are staying in hotels. You know, they're struggling with getting uh, resources to be able to cook for themselves. And, you know, like it's really hard when you only have a microwave. So they actually had collected um, crock pots for people. And so being able to actually have that ability to cook because we've been just seeing a lot more with our shelters filling up, a lot more of the families staying in hotels. And I just thought that that was an amazing idea. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. That is a really awesome solution. 
Um, one that I hadn't even, hadn't even thought of, but I had, yeah, crock pots in a hotel room is a great way to make really healthy, sustainable meals. <clears throat> and I want to clarify, those <laughs> crock pots were donated. We did not buy those <laughs> with the money, the grant money. <laughs> that ODE is always listening, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know if I need, I want to go here or not. I'm scheduled. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because I think we're coming in looking. It may be the fact is we're all looking for, for a different solution and some ideas. So, you know, I'm jotting down looking for potential partners in food banks, faith-based organizations, civic groups, grocery stores, restaurants, um, trying to create weekend programs, trying to partner with, with community agencies <clears throat> elsewhere. And she's going to kill me, but um, Casey McVickers in this room, and she does work for RESC um, directly. Uh, she does a lot of direct work with families. I'm guessing before she came into this room today that she's tried all of those. And I feel like there's there's a bit of disconnect between the description of the problem and new and novel solutions that aren't really new and novel. And and I don't know how to get at what I'm getting at other than that's not kind of getting us anywhere to come up with a list of solutions that I'm, I'm guessing three-fourths of the people in the room have already thought about. And is there is there some new or something novel or some movement out there that we can connect with I, you know, I, I, in the same sense, I'm thinking, I, I no, I, I would be very, very concerned about respect for, for cultural and religious values and, and traditions. And yet the absolute reality is there are some kids out there, if they get a pepperoni stick and a little Debbie, they're going to be happy because that's their only choice. So I feel like there's a big description of this problem that really isn't getting at the reality of the problem and the roadblocks that are there and trying to solve them. Suggesting going out to other organizations when we've already done that, I'm sure. And I, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just trying to find a better way to connect the advice out there with, with the roadblocks on a day-to-day -day basis and suggest, suggesting to go to a church or a restaurant ain't helping. But I maybe maybe that's not a function that we can get here. I don't know if any of that tirade made sense, but I I feel like we're we're just kind of looking for I don't know new and novel ideas. I, I don't mean to be critical, but but I'm feeling very disconnected between right. Right. The so understanding that, of the real we, problem. Right. So part of this up. part of this community of practice is to come together and we we won't always solve all the problems, but what we can do together is acknowledge there is a problem and a challenge. Um, so from this webinar, um, I feel encouraged to encourage you all that do know your nutrition supervisors to have a conversation if you haven't. Um, they are the food experts and they may have a solution to the problem that we don't even know yet. Um, so I think some things I've learned is sometimes we don't know what to ask, but I think right now we have an opportunity to connect with our nutrition staff if you haven't done that already and just listen and see if there could be an innovative solution to some of the the issues. Um, and I know Kohayo and I will take this back to the drawing board and see if we might be able to uh, scour Schoolhouse Connection and other national sites to see what else may be going on around the country. Um, yeah, I'll let you take it over. Amanda, I think if you're doing the close. 
Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much. And I just want to acknowledge that um, when we're and briefly, because I know we need to wrap up, that when we're working on these big problems, it is really frustrating to feel like you have no avenue or no new option. And, um, you know, I, I'm not in a position in this space to talk specifically about advocacy, but I would just invite folks to think about, um, you know, what is, is it, is it, you know, that we need more and better SNAP benefits? Is it, you know, um, so think about those big solutions while also dealing with the real problems on the day to day. And Susanna, I hope that was okay to say. Um, again, not not giving any lobbying advice mm -hmm. or direct advocate, you know, specific right. advice, but yeah, you know, yeah, we do what we can in our space. And um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. And so um, we do have a couple more slides, but in light of time, I think that um, we will just allow you to review those. Basically, there's an example of a, a program that we found that we thought was interesting, a description of the upcoming um, sessions, and a reminder about some materials that we'll be coming up with. Um, and uh, a link to, uh, so we invite you, if you haven't already, to complete the course to home uh, community of practice survey. That's going to help inform our efforts going forward. So that's a great place to provide us with your feedback on what would be useful in this space. Um, we also just have a specific feedback um, survey for this session um, that I think uh, Evelyn or Ami can also put in the chat. We always are looking to spotlight your district or ESC in the work that you're doing. So if you have uh, an innovative solution, and um, we encourage you to reach out to us to, um, you know, so that we could share that and highlight the work we're doing in this space or in our newsletter. Um, and then we'll, uh, of course, have also a list of resources. And please um, continue to send your technical assistance requests to homelesseducation at cohio.org. We love to um, work with you, find out what's happening in your communities, and see how we can best support you. Um, so that was really quick, but we're almost 10 minutes over. So uh, we'll stick around in case anybody has, um, you know, some questions for us here at Cohio. We'll hang out for a couple minutes, but thank you. I think we only lost a couple people going over 10 minutes. So thanks so much for being here. We appreciate all of you and hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.